Would you turn with me now to Romans chapter 8? And I look again at verses beginning at verse 18. This is Romans 8, and looking at verses beginning with verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I have entitled my sermon today in this manner. I call it Paradise Restored. And I take that title because in the verses here in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul is speaking about two aspects of the world in which we live. The first aspect is that it is a groaning universe. The whole creation groans and travails in pain. Verse 22. And not only they, but ourselves also, meaning Christians, we groan within ourselves. So that is the first of two main points which the Apostle here gives us in this section of Scripture. It is a reminder that we live in a ruined world. The universe is now in a state of decay. It is in a rotten condition. And you and I know that very well because of all the sad things that go on in this world. Now, my friends, when God created the universe in the beginning, it was entirely different from what it is today. When God made the universe, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, he made everything out of nothing in a space of six days, and it was all very good. There was nothing in the universe that God made which in any sense had any sin or rottenness or decay anywhere in it. Think about that. It means that as God made the world, everything was perfect, exactly what was the best condition for it to be in. The sun was never too hot, If there was rain, it was never too much, but perhaps there was no rain. There was no anxiety, nothing to make the people who lived in the world as God made it anxious or worried or troubled. No, no, all the relationships that would have lived in that early universe, had there not been sin, they would have been perfectly happy because you know that in the days before Adam sinned, mankind had no fear of death. There was no death going to come to mankind before Adam sinned. Before Adam sinned, everything was 100% perfect and beautiful. And therefore we refer to it as paradise. But now, as you know very well, all that changed. 
all that changed terribly. When Adam sinned, he brought a curse upon the entire world. And that's why the world is so very different today. The sun sometimes gets far too hot, especially in countries in the Middle East. I have a neighbour across the road from me and he was telling me that in the country he comes from in the Middle East, the temperature was about 120 for a week or two. Imagine the heat of that. It's almost impossible to live in a climate, is it not, like that. But then, as we know very well, everything changed. When Adam sinned, God sent a curse upon the whole world. Animals that used to be peaceable before were now dangerous. Lions and tigers and snakes. They were ready to attack man and woman and to kill them. That certainly was not in the thought of any animal before Adam sinned. But once Adam sinned, God sent a curse upon the entire world. Everything changed. The sun changed. He was no, no longer so comfortable. <laughs> the weather changed. Our feelings changed. We realized God is angry with us. The curse came upon the whole world. So the human family then, they used to be and would have been perfectly happy had they continued without sin, was changed. And we see that all around us today, don't we? We're hearing just now about Afghanistan, a country of the Middle East. And there are soldiers there who are running along and killing men and women, chopping their hands off, taking the women, making them four women to a man to be their wives, unspeakably wicked, cruel, cruel. And all of these things have come in because Paradise needs to be restored, and it's not yet been restored. Death and eternal punishment are all round about us in this world. Isn't it sad that there are so many people who never think of coming to the house of God? Oh, how you and I would love to see all these seats filled up with people anxiously listening to the gospel and finding out how they can be right with God. But alas, alas, so many people are busy going round with a dog, enjoying talking to the dog. Can you believe it? So many people enjoy running round the district in order to get a bit of exercise as though they couldn't do that on the other days of the week, but must also do it on a Sabbath day. Oh, dear friends, no wonder the Apostle Paul writes as he does. Verse 28, we know... <coughs> All things work together for good to them that love God. But that's not yet happened. Verse 22, the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Paradise is ruined. The wonderful things that God created were sublime and perfect and they were exactly what we would have wished to have had. But when Adam sinned, down came the curse of God. And that's what the Apostle is referring to here. And it's no wonder that God sent a curse upon this world. Because this world hates God. It's no accident that people would rather go around a town with a dog. <laughs> than come to the house of God and listen to the gospel. It's because people who are not Christians, they hate God. Don't say to me that's speaking too strongly. No, no, it's exactly the truth. If people don't believe in God, if they don't love God, if they don't know that Jesus Christ is their saviour, <laughs> then I have to say to you, they hate God. And they would kill him if they could. And that's why they killed Jesus Christ, because he is God the Son. So my dear friends, here is the sad condition of our fallen world. No wonder, Paul says here, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. However, 
In this passage of scripture, there's great comfort. And we find it in verses 24 and 28. <laughs> we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So the wonderful news is that although the world today is ruined, and although today people hate God and will not come to his house or read his word or take seriously the offer of the gospel, yet it won't always be like that. God has a purpose which is being fulfilled just now. He has a purpose. He puts it like this. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So God has a purpose. That means a plan. God is working out something wonderful in the world today whether people realize it or not, and it is a purpose. And this purpose is to draw men and women and boys and girls out of a state of sin into which we were born and to bring them into a state of grace so that they might be prepared for eternal glory when Jesus comes again at the end of the world. Here is the hope we have. It's not for today. Today, the whole creation groans and travails in pain. It's an interesting expression, that expression, travails in pain. The word travail is used of a mother when she is about to have her baby. She travails, that is, she feels the pain and she does what she can to push the child out of her body, which is the way God has made her, very wonderfully. And that's the way Christians are. They travail in pain. They long to be able to get rid of the troubles of this world. They long to get rid of the trans uh, disobedience and transgressions and the hatred of God and disobedience to the Bible. Because they know the day is coming when God's purpose will be fulfilled. And that purpose is something which is going to be fulfilled. Now Jesus, as the Bible tells us, has two comings to this world. He has the first coming, which is over and done 2,000 years ago, but he has a second coming. We don't know the date of it, we're not told, but we're told and we're sure of it that the blessed Lord Jesus Christ will come again one day to put an end to time. Now, when that happens, it means all the clocks in the world will stop and people will get a terrible shock. All the clocks in the world will suddenly stop. And people will look at their watches and say, it, it's not moving, it stopped. Let me look at the clock, it's not moving. There's no more time, time is over. And that's what will happen. And when they lift up their eyes to heaven, they will see Jesus in all his glory, coming down for what we call his second coming. Now, why did Jesus have a first coming and then a second coming? He came the first time to deal with the problem of sin. You and I, of course, are sinners, and we need to have our sins forgiven. So he came the first time to live for us a perfect life and to die for us a death on the cross to pay the price for our sin. So Jesus' first coming was in order to put away the problem of sin. So when as sinners we ask for God's forgiveness, God will most certainly forgive our sins. I hope we all know that here. I hope you know that personally, every one of you. But if you confess your sins to God, he will most certainly and readily forgive your sins, all of them. When we, press, when we profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will forgive and pardon all our sin, every single one. 
And he will never blame us in the day of judgment. He will not say, depart from me, as he will say to the wicked. He will say, come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's his first coming. He died for sin. But when he comes the second time, it will be to put the universe right. You see, as Paul tells us here, we live in a ruined universe. He puts it like this. He says, the whole creation groans and travails in pain. And that's the way the world is. It's a ruined world. It's a spoiled world. The sun doesn't function correctly. Our health doesn't function correctly. Why do we have hospitals? It's because we get sick and ill. We have to be taken off in the ambulance. We're not feeling well. What else is wrong with us? Well, we can't serve God for very long in this world. When you come to your 80s, as some of us have come to, you can't do what you could when you were in your 20s or 30s, can you? And you see, it's because our sin is being punished in us in this life. Our sin means that because Adam sinned and his sin is imputed to us, as a consequence of that, our bodies are rotting away. They're going to die. We're going to have to face death. We can't pretend that death will never come our way. It will. The day will come when you'll hear death knocking at the door and you'll know very well, I haven't got long to go. But the Christian doesn't mind that because the Christian knows when death comes, he is going to leave this sad world and is going to go to a better world. But the unbeliever doesn't know that. And he's terrified at the thought of death coming because he's not ready to go. It's a wonderful verse in Ecclesiastes that goes like this. I wonder if you're familiar with it. It says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. That comes as a shock, doesn't it? The day of death, he says, is better than the day of birth. How do we explain that? Well, like this. He's not talking about the unbeliever, because that's not true of the unbeliever, but it is true of the believer. The day of death is better than the day of life for the unbeliever, day of birth for the unbeliever, for the believer, because when a believer dies, he enters into glory. But when the believer was born, all those years ago when he was a little child, when the child was born, he was born into a sinful world. A world which is, as Paul tells us here, all gone wrong, a ruined world, a rotten world, a sinful world, a carnal world. So that is why for the Christian, death is better than birth. Death takes the Christian out of all the troubles of this life and brings him into the immediate presence of God. And there he will be happy, world without end. So when Jesus comes a second time, then it will not be to deal with sin, but to deal with the universe. He will stop all the clocks, time will finish, and he will make new heavens and a new earth. And what will he do with the present heavens and earth? He'll burn them up with tremendous heat. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, all will be burned up with tremendous fire. And... It'll be a terrible time for those who are not Christians, won't it? When they see coming, Jesus coming down in all his glory, they'll be terrible. They'll scream and shout to the hills and mountains to fall on our heads and hide us from this man who's coming to judge the world. Save us from this terrible man who's coming to judge the world. That's the way they'll talk. The Bible tells us that. How foolish people are they not, not to get right with God. That's why, my beloved friends, that's why you and I must make it our number one duty in life to make sure we believe in Jesus Christ as our Saviour. That's the one thing that matters more than anything else, to make sure we have given our hearts to Christ and put our trust in Him. Because when He comes, we'll have nothing to fear. He'll simply take all His believing people into glory and they will be happy ever after. 
Well, now, that's then to say why Jesus will come the second time. Now, we must comfort ourselves in the light of this, and as Christians, we must remind ourselves that the Lord Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of God, and it's all part of God's purpose. Verse 28, he says, We know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So the purpose of God then is to prepare for the end of the world and prepare for the punishment of the wicked and to prepare for new heavens and a new earth. And the Apostle Paul here tells us that there are five things which we must know about this purpose of God. We get it like this. He puts it like this. He says, verse 28, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For, here's the explanation, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And whom he predestinated, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Verse 28, 9 and 30. So this divine purpose that God is working is this. God is preparing his people for heaven and for glory. God knows very well that it's a very, very difficult thing to live in this present world. It's a world under his curse, under his wrath, under his judgment. And my dear friend, it's not surprising that we find it hard to live in this world. Oh, we do, don't we? Think of all the awful things that are happening in the world. When I was a little boy, we lived as a family near Manchester. And in those days, we were being bombed day and night with aeroplanes from Germany coming overhead. Bombs, bombs, bombs. You never knew when you went to bed if you'd wake up in the morning or if you'd be dead. You didn't know if your mother would be alive or your father was dead. That was what was happening. And I'm sure you know this, but roughly 55 million people died in the Second World War. And about six or seven million of them were Jews. They were doing terrible things to the Jews. They were throwing the Jewish babies into the fire and burning them as though they were pieces of wood. You see what a cruel world it is. Oh, it's a broken universe. All things are groaning. Yes, says Paul, it's a groaning universe. And we also, as Christians, we are groaning. We are longing for that better world above. As Christians, we long for the day when we shall see the blessed Jesus, our Lord himself, with our own eyes. And throw ourselves at his feet and say, Oh, blessed Jesus, what a lot of things I have to thank thee for. Thou didst die for me. But now then I say, Paul here tells us that there are these five elements in the plan of God. Verse 29 of verse 30. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So there are five things there. First of all, foreknowledge, predestination, then calling, then justification, and then glorification. And these are the five points which the Apostle Paul brings to us as the purpose of God for his people who are being prepared for heaven. They don't refer to everybody in the world. Everybody who wants to be saved is welcome to be saved. If you ever talk to somebody who's not a Christian and they would like to become a Christian, you can tell them, you are very welcome. You will be most welcomed by God if you want to be saved. God will certainly save you. But now I must tell you, you say to them, if you're not saved, then you'll be burnt up when Jesus comes. 
and you'll be eternally punished when he comes back in a second coming. These five things then, what are they? <laughs> Whom he did foreknow. Foreknow here means to love beforehand. And God loved those who are going to go to heaven before he made the world. This is a very deep subject. Before there was a world, before Adam lived, before Adam and Eve existed, God knew who was going to go to heaven. And he predestinated them. That means to say, he, in his purpose and plan, he made arrangements that these people would be brought to salvation through faith in Christ. This is very deep, I know, because he talks about things that happened before the world existed. But God existed, of course, before the world existed. And God had things in his mind before there was a world. And he predestinated means he wrote down in his divine book the names of the men and women and young people whom he was going to save out of a state of sin and to bring them to a state of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So foreknowledge is his love. Predestination, he puts their names down. And then uh, he calls them. <clears throat> now the calling is the gospel. We refer to it as the gospel call. And it's a very simple call, very clear. It's not complicated. You don't have to go to university to understand it. The gospel call is this. Sinners, sinners, you must believe in Jesus if you want to be saved. Sinners, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and God promises he will forgive you. And he certainly will. That's the call. It tells us that he died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. But then it says we must believe in Jesus if we are to enjoy the benefit of his death. So the calling is the gospel call. And whom he called, them he also justified. That means when a person puts their faith in Christ, then the righteousness of Christ is given as a free gift to that sinner. And all his sins are immediately forgiven. That is justification, a wonderful doctrine. We are justified by faith alone, without the works of the law. Sadly, this is where the Roman Catholic Church has gone wrong. The Roman Catholic Church went terribly wrong by saying, we're not justified simply by our faith in Christ, we must also have good works. And, um, but that's exactly a mistake, because it's what the Bible does not teach. So we don't look to ourselves and our good works in order to make ourselves hopeful of eternal life. Faith alone, in Christ alone, is the way whereby God justifies a sinner. Would you allow me, beloved friends, because I love you all so much, to ask yourself, are you, every one of you, a true and genuine justified Christian? Do you know what it is to give your life to Christ, to put your faith in Christ? Have you experienced that transformation in your life? Years ago, when I was a minister in air, I had a wonderful experience, many, many of them, but this one especially. This lady came to me one day and she said, Mr. Roberts, she said, I, I'm not sure what it means to be a Christian. Well, I said, you need to be born again. Born again, she said, how can you be born again? Oh, I said, come to church and you'll find out. So she came to church with her family for a whole year, every Sabbath morning for a whole year. And at the end of a whole year, oh, she said, I see it now, I understand it. And she had the experience of being born again. And she lifted the telephone and phoned all her friends and she got about 30 people coming to church to tell them, you must be born again, she said, you've got to be born again. And her own family, they were converted too. She had a son who was a bit of a rascal and he used to do uh, works in Asia, flying across to Asia and getting money and flying back again. And one day as he was talking to one of his colleagues and this the bad thing they were doing, his colleague just dropped down dead. Talked to another colleague and he dropped down dead. Oh, said this young man, I better get back home and give my life to Christ. So he did. 
And it's been a Christian preaching the gospel now for maybe 20 years or so. And I mention that, you see, because it shows this is the all-important thing. We've got to have this experience of the new birth to be born again. And those whom God justifies, them he will glorify. Now, to make it nice for us all to take home, the Apostle Paul gives us encouragements at the end of this chapter. And I'm going to close by giving you these encouragements. Verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's a tremendous encouragement. Some people say to you, how can you be sure you're right? You may profess your faith in Christ, but how can you be sure you're going to go to heaven? How can you be certain? You may be deluded. Your hope may be nonsense. The answer is, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's one of the comforts. Another one is this. God did not spare his own son, but he wanted Christ, his own son, to die on the cross for us. Well, if he wouldn't spare Christ, but gave him to die for us, there's the comfort we have. He certainly will do everything he promises he will do. Another comfort is this. Christ, in all his glory, is preparing us for the trials to come, and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That's the wonderful way this chapter ends. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And he gives a long list. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a list. Huge lot of list. The devil, you see, would like to spoil our comfort. He would like to make us doubt whether we truly are converted, even when we are. And here then is the assurance we have that if God be for us, who can be against us? So, beloved friend, you and I, if we trust in Jesus, we have this wonderful help, hope that when Jesus comes back, he'll make a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And therefore, whilst we're here in this world, this rotten, ruined world, let us be patient. Let us remember what is said in Scripture. We look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. That's heaven. Very soon, all true believers in Christ will be with Jesus in his glory. We shall see him face to face. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Is that your experience? That you are pure in heart? If not, my beloved friend, give your heart to God this very day and make sure you are ready for Christ's return. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ and all he has done for us poor dying sinners. He, Lord, is our only hope, but oh, what a sure and certain hope he is. We thank thee that he said to his disciples, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We pray, Lord, that every one of us here, from the youngest to the oldest, every one of us, may be loved by thee, may hear thy call, may become justified and glorified so that every one of us here may all meet again one day in that wonderful world above, where we long to be with Christ, thy Son. Here is now and pardon us for Jesus' sake. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.